views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello and happy new year. Welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm Darren Jaime and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough, especially when we sit down with our political and legal analyst J.C. Polanco. Coming up, we'll meet a candidate for Congress in District 15. And then, after that, we're going to learn more about the collapse of the wind turbine in Co-op City with Senator Jamal T. Bailey. Next, we'll sit with the producer and the host of The Essence Show, discussing how she empowers Latinas and minorities through her show and her Get In Line movement. Then afterwards, we'll speak with the director and manager of NYC Legal Hand, Tremont, discussing how the organization is providing individuals with free legal information. And then a little later on in the show, we'll talk with a financial literacy coach, sharing how you can better manage your money and make more appropriate finance decisions in your life. And then we're gonna learn more about a Bronx author's upcoming book based on the activism of Colin Kaepernick, titled Young Cat. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. We're officially open. Hello everyone, I'm Darren Jaime and today is Wednesday, January the 8th and you are now watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is being broadcast simultaneously on MNN's channels. You can also stay connected to us on all our social media platforms at BronxNet Television. Well, some things have been going on through the past week. We'll take you through it with our Bronx Updates. Well, the deadline to obtain the New York State Real ID is getting closer. Beginning October the 1st, New York driver's licenses, permits, and state identification cards must be Real ID compliant as state-issued identification cards become compliant with federal standards. Beginning in the fall, driver's licenses and state IDs that are not Real ID compliant will not be accepted as identification by federal authorities. This means New Yorkers who haven't switched over won't be able to use their state-issued ID taking domestic flights unless they have a valid passport. The real ID will become mandatory for domestic flights and intermilitary bases and other federal, certain federal sites. Now, it's not required to get a driver's license, vote, or to receive federal benefits. In other news, in the world of politics, on Friday, January the 3rd, President Donald Trump ordered a precision strike to terminate a top Iranian commander, General Qasim Soleimani. However, Iran stated in a letter to the United Nations calling the attack state terrorism and an unlawful criminal act. New York City is preparing for a potential reprisal. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio stated at a security briefing at City Hall, quote, there's no way to predict what happens next. No one has to be reminded that New York City is the number one terror target in the United States, end quote. So, how does the recent attacks affect the city? What does this mean for the United States moving forward? Here now, tell us more is our political and legal analyst, J.C. Polanco. J.C., good to have you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Listen, let's get right at it. Of course, this terror attack, uh, or I should say this attack, really brings to mind for a lot of New Yorkers the threat of terror coming right here at our door. Well, you know what? I think Mayor de Blasio is right for once. Uh, you know, we are constantly under terror watch. We know we are the terror capital of the country. Right? We know that we can at any point be hit because we're an open society. Our trains don't require metal detectors, right? Mm -hmm. Our restaurants either. So it's always something in the back of our heads, especially since 9-11, that New York City is in fact vulnerable to an attack. What's happening in Iran today, 
uh, sends shivers down the spines of many of us who were here in 9-11 and think that maybe something can happen here in the United States. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that something that won't happen in the future, but for us to be an alert, I think it's the right message. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the attack itself. A lot of people questioning President Trump, his decision to attack yeah. Iran. Well, he didn't attack Iran. He attacked General Soleimani. He took him out. This is the issue. The issue is that the last two presidents had opportunities to take him out and didn't because of the potential repercussions. But this is what we do know. And I know that when it comes to President Trump, I, like many other Bronxites, find him to be incredibly polarizing. And he can say today is Wednesday, and I'll say, ah, oh, maybe not, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when it comes to this issue, let's this, this give it an, an opportunity to remember that we have troops in harm's way. We have people that are right now uh, Bronxites serving in the Middle East that are, that are in danger of losing their lives in an attack. We are in a state where we, ha we are in combat against Iran. We should remember that before we begin the politics of this, of this discussion. The fact of the matter is that Soleimani has American blood in his hands. Like Democrats and Republicans have said, they're shedding no tears about his death. The fact of the matter is Soleimani killed over 1,500 people that were unarmed citizens that were merely protesting. Over 603 Americans have died, and many others have, in fact, lost use of their limbs because of Soleimani and his cohorts. So the fact that he's no longer with us is a good thing. The problem is, what now? Are we now in a position where we're now more in danger? Are our soldiers now more in danger? And what we saw in the attacks last night, from the latest reports, there have been no casualties, very little damage as far as our, um, our, our airplanes at the, at the American military base that was attacked last night. So what does President Trump do now? Does he say now we're even, or does he go ahead and launch another attack? Because I think this is where cooler heads have to prevail. And I think Bronxites are seeing this as an opportunity for the president to maybe say, okay, you launched some attacks last night, we got your guy, let's stop now, and let's figure out how we can get back to the negotiating table. Because if not, let's face it, if President Trump this morning decides that he's going to launch uh, an attack against Iran for last night's attack of over 12 missiles, 12 ballistic missiles that hit our American military site, we may be heading to another long, drawn-out war in Iran. But talking to New Yorkers, hearing the flavor of New Yorkers, of course, throughout the course of the city, a lot of tension, a lot of worry, because, of course, we're a prime target for retaliation. We've always been a prime target. This guy Soleimani and the Iranians have had people around the country committing terrorism against the United States. We have lost hundreds of thousands of Americans because of people like Soleimani and his terrorist network. So we've always been under the careful watch that something can happen. The fact that now we're in combat with Iran puts us on higher alert. Nothing will change for New Yorkers. You know we're resilient. We're going to take our trains. We're going to get to work. Uh, we're going to be on guard. And if we see something like the mayor say, says, say something. So we're always going to have to be careful, but we have to always keep in mind that we have Bronxites and Americans in harm's way, and before we go on Facebook and on Twitter to attack and calling them like, and I have to tell you, I don't know if Bronxites have seen this or not, but you have some out there, some prominent folks out there calling this terrorism, American terrorism, calling our soldiers terrorists, calling the mission terrorism. I think that's wrong. It sends the wrong message because you know and I know a lot of our soldiers that come out of the Bronx, that go to Fordham Road, sign up to go serve abroad and keep us safe are not terrorists. And I think it's doing a lot of disservice. A lot of disservice. Where do we see things going over the next couple of weeks? I don't know. I, I just don't know with President Trump. We don't know what's going to happen this morning. It's, I mean, this morning he's going to uh, explain what he's going to do next. I really hope he pulls back and says, you know, you, you aimed at us, you failed, you missed. Uh, let's, let's see about getting to a negotiating table. All right, J.C. Blanco, that's why we got you here. Thank Thanks you. a lot, J.C. Blanco. Appreciate it. And that's all we have for our Bronx updates. We are going to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to talk to a candidate for the Congress in District 15. That's coming up right after this here on Open. Praise the Lord, I'm Evangelist Barbara Mayo. I have a program called The Great God. I come on every Saturday at 3.30, channel 70 and 36 on fire. You need to catch me because it's a, current, uh, a program to encourage, to lift up, and if you don't know anybody that uh, 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 haven't heard about the program, tell them about it. They'll be encouraged, for God is good. God bless you.
And thank you for staying with us. Well, last year, several candidates for Congress have emerged to represent District 15 after Congressman Jose Serrano finishes his term. With primary elections set for June 23rd, we'd like to introduce the candidates for District 15 to our viewers here at Bronxnet. Now, we've reached out to all who have officially entered the race and have spoken to candidates Jonathan Ortiz, Tomas Ramos, Assemblyman Michael Blake, Councilmember Richie Torres, David Franks Jr., and Melissa Mark Viverito. And joining us today to discuss District 15, his candidacy, issues concerning the district, and more is candidate for Congress, District 15, Friend Held Besora. Thank you so much Hi. for being with us. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, good to have you. Likewise, yeah. So as we talk about District 15, obviously uh, it's a seat that's going to be open after Congressman Serrano finishes his term in office. You made the decision to say you want to run. Why is that? Yes. So I, like so many of us, I am a son of the Bronx. Uh, my family moved from the Dominican Republic to the Grand Concourse um, in the 90s. And so I was raised by a single mother. Uh, I'm the oldest of three. And so you have uh, my powerful, incredible mother having been recently arrived to the United States. Um, and then she's raising her children in a new nation, a new city, um, by herself. Uh, so one of the reasons why I am running is that I understand a lot of what the difficulties that our families go through every single day in our district. Uh, we grew up on the concourse. I went to public school at Concourse Village. I went to Cardinal Hayes High School. I stayed in New York for university. I was the first person in my family to go to college. Um, and I've been serving our communities since graduation. Um, I decided to run because I felt that our people have been excluded for far too long. Um, in New York City, on the national stage, I feel that for the first time in 30 years, we the people of the Bronx have a real chance uh, to address not only the difficulties that our district faces, uh, but through that change how this nation approaches a low income, uh, communities and communities of color. Let me jump in here and talk about what do you find to be the prominent issues in your district right now? Of course, yeah. So the our goal is to address uh, the poverty crisis in District 15. District 15 is one of the most morally wealthy and rich uh, district in the country. However, it's time that we take that strength and make sure that we become leaders in Washington, D.C., right? Our vision is to make NY15 a leader nationally in terms of bringing about change. Mm -hmm. um, so addressing and attacking and eradicating poverty in our district will require uh, a holistic approach. The biggest three are housing. Uh, we believe that housing is a human right in the United States of America. We believe in the homes guarantee, eliminating homelessness, eliminating uh, housing insecurity. Uh, making sure that housing is treated as something uh, that we all have access to. Uh, from there, we have uh, jobs. For far too long, New York 15 has been excluded from this nation's uh, great economy. Uh, so we want to make sure that we implement a federal jobs guarantee uh, for specifically for low-income people of New York 15 and have that be a gateway to help them uh, get to that next level. Um, a lot of what our families and our people struggle with is that systemic uh, trapping where we are forgotten about. And the only way that we're going to break those chains uh, is get to Washington, D.C. and make sure that legislation is being passed specifically for our people in New York 15 uh, and for our most vulnerable congressional districts throughout the country. You talked earlier about the voice being heard in about 30 years, and you referenced 30 years. Yeah. Are, are you satisfied with the work of Congressman Serrano, or what, what, where, how do you see that? I think, I think, so I was fortunate enough uh, to intern in his office, right? It was my first time in Washington, D.C. Uh, as a son of the Bronx, uh, I will always be grateful for Serrano's uh, great work in Congress. I think that we have all learned from things from Serrano. Um, but I also think that in this new decade uh, and in this new generation, we have what it takes to change the very foundation of how uh, low income status and poverty are approached um, in our nation. And it's something that we are going to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, in the greatest country in the world, there is no reason why 
our families should be struggling in the way that they're struggling. And that is very much what we look forward to. How do you answer critics who say, okay, not too big on uh, political experience? How do you answer that? Well, I, so on one end, my experience is having been raised in the Bronx, having seen uh, my mother struggle, right? We, as a family, we have faced and conquered through housing and income insecurity, having been uh, in temporary housing. We faced the difficulties that immigration that immigration brings about uh, to families. Mm -hmm. We have achieved sometimes the impossible, and I've seen it within families in New York 15. So our political experience, in addition to me having served uh, in our districts, our political experience comes from having lived these issues and understanding that in our approach to eradicating poverty, in our approach to lifting all of our families, we can have absolutely no compromise. Um, this. It's our turn, right? This is about us. This is about us taking the power back. This is about us making sure that we let the world know that New York 15 is no longer going to be forgotten. Um, and it's the people who, we hold offices every day. It's the single mothers and single fathers. It's the educators. It's the students who every single day are living what we are experiencing in New York 15 and living these difficulties. So it's a matter of taking those real experiences and bringing them to Washington. We've had, I have a lot of respect for people who have served, but I also, I am here to prioritize our people and this is what this is about. Real quickly, we only have a couple of seconds left, but what of do you course. find here the biggest issue that you hear with boots on the ground? What's the biggest issue you're hearing from your constituents? So. The biggest, and again, it's a holistic approach, right? Our district, one of the greatest districts and one of the most powerful districts in the country has a mental health crisis that we have to address. We need to pass national legislation that will address mental health in our most low-income communities. Our district has a housing crisis, right, with housing not being guaranteed for our most vulnerable people, and our uh, district has a jobs and education crisis that we're going to make sure uh, to address in an overhaul. Fernel Basora, thank you so much for thank coming and so sharing with us. Me. I really appreciate Candidate it. Candidate for Congress, District yes. 15. Good to have you. Thank you. Welcome Likewise. here to Open. All righty. Appreciate it. Listen, taking a quick break, we are going to talk after the break to Senator Jamal T. Bailey about the recent wind turbine incident. Stay tuned. Welcome back. On December 30th, a newly installed wind turbine came down, striking a billboard in the parking lot of a shopping center in Co-op City. Joining us now on the phone to share a little bit more details about the incident is New York State Senator of District 36, Jamal T. Bailey. And we welcome uh, Senator Bailey. Good to have you on the phone. Good morning, Darren. How are you? Hey, good to have you. I'm good. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Listen, let's get right at it. Uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about this wind turbine coming down. Obviously, a lot of your residents in Co-op City had made arguments that this should have been taken care of a long time ago, but give me your reaction to how things are today. Well, we are still still disappointed that this was even the structure was even allowed to be placed in that area. Um, it, and as, I, as I've said many times, and it bears worth repeating, clean energy isn't the problem. I'm a fan of clean energy. I'm a clean. I'm a fan of making sure that we have a better environment. 
But simply because you can play something somewhere does not mean that you should do so. And especially in an area such as Co-op City, uh, population, significant population density, it's an eyesore to the building. It rises above the majestic buildings of Co-op City. So that in itself is a problem, and residents indicated that, that, that it's a problem, and myself and my colleagues in government were continuing to see that there's something that we can get this done, done about this. And correct me if I'm wrong, this was done, I mean, this wind turbine has been around since it was practically, what, an amusement park back in the day? Well, the wind turbine itself wasn't around. Um, so w what happened was that um, Co-op City used to be Freedom Land, and as such, it was zoned for an amusement park. And, and from my understanding, the, the majority of Co-op City was zoned correctly, except for that one strip at 500 Baychester Avenue. Um, and and the, the property owner, uh, I, my assumption is the, uh, the property owner knew about that and decided to apply for a said permit. Um, and again, that's the, that's the central point of just because you can't do something doesn't mean that you should do something. If you're looking to do that, there, there should have been conversations with the community board, with River Bay, with uh, the constituents who are the most important part of any, um, anything that we do in the community. We should speak to the community first and see what their feelings are about it. And, and I guess that's, that, that was my biggest issue with it. Um, yes, it's an eyesore, and I don't think it should have been put there anyway, but there was absolutely no community involvement or discussion about the placement of this turbine. Well, fortunately, no one was hurt. Where do things go from here? Uh, and, and again, it was by the grace of God, uh, I would say. Usually, it's luck, we're lucky that school was out of session that day. Um, usually at around 1.30 to 1.45 p.m. When that, um, when, when that incident took place, on a normal day, there are tens, if not hundreds of children congregating in, in that parking lot. It's near a 7-Eleven, cross the street from a Popeye's and a McDonald's where children are getting food after they leave high school or middle school. That could have been disastrous, absolutely disastrous. Where, where we go from here is, is we're still trying to have conversations with the property owner, having, having conversations with the Department of Buildings, and hopefully, look, we can, hopefully we can have a conversation where something like this is no longer in that, in that space. Yeah. We understand that the Depart Department of Buildings has said an investigation is ongoing into the cause of the collapse. It's not clear whether the turbine actually generated electricity or was merely uh, decorative. And, and that's and again, that's that's something that we're still trying to ascertain right now as well. Uh, we're still trying to have co conversations with the uh, Department of Buildings about the what the operational state of that turbine was, and, and it's uh, it borders on the it borders on irony that uh, a wind turbine was taken down by a wind gust. Mm -hmm. Well, Senator Bailey, while I, still, while I have you here, uh, I want to ask you a question on the front page of the New York Post, uh, criticism about cash bail. I know that's legislation that you got uh, enacted. Talk to us about the criticism and your reaction. Well, uh, we're looking to stop wealth-based detention. Um, you should not be in jail. Nobody should be incarcerated simply because of what they can pay or, most import or as has been seen, cannot pay. Um, Khalif Browder, you know, spent... In an, inordinate, in an inordinate amount of time incarcerated because his family cannot pay $3,000 worth of bail uh, to, to, get, to get him out of jail. These are the things, this is, these are the reasons why we're looking to end, we, we, we ended cash bail on the majority of nonviolent, of misdemeanors and nonviolent felony offenses. Um, that, that, that is why we did it. And, and that is, a, I think, a, a laudable goal. And I think that New Yorker, New Yorkers is, is all the better for it. Talk to us about revisions, because there's some people who feel like the legislation needs more revision. Are you comfortable with the way things are? Do you think there still needs to be more revisions attached? I think, there, I think the legislation is only eight days old, and, and I think that we have to be able to, as legislators, you have to be willing to have a conversation about anything. But at the same time, the legislation is eight days old, and, and, and I think that we have to be able to see what, we haven't even reached a 30-day period where we can see statistics about, about, what has taken place. It's change. Change is difficult for many people. Change is uncomfortable for many people. But we, we have not given this, in my opinion, um, the, the, the proper amount of time to see whether it works or not. I believe that it does work, but it's only eight days to tell. We can't tell on either side. All right. Well, Senator Bailey, thank you for taking the time to share with us a little bit more about the wind turbine and also about this legislation. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Darren. Have a great day. All right, have a good one now. All right, for more on Senator Bailey, you can follow him on Facebook and Twitter at Jamal T. Bailey. We are taking a quick break, but when we come back, 
We're going to sit down with the producer and the host of the The Essence Show. That's coming up right after this. I was there. I was there. allí. So many symptoms came on me all at once. Shortness of breath. I stopped sleeping. I was getting laryngitis. Emotionally, I was a basket case. None of these issues did I have before 9-11. The World Trade Center Health Program gave me hope. You don't have medical insurance? That should not be a problem because the fundings are already there. The doctor told me when I spoke with her, she says, I could fill a room with people that sound just like you. They were very thorough, very caring and empathetic. When I left there, I had a plan in hand. If you're sick because of 9-11 and its aftermath, the World Trade Center Health Program can help you. There's no other place like this. It saved my life. And welcome back. The De Essence Show is a show catering to empower Latinas, minorities, and sharing their experiences in a comfortable and a safe environment. And we've got a very special guest in the studio. Tell us more about it is the producer and host of the De Essence Show, De Essence Romero. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. I'm glad to have you. Feel a little nervous on the other side? No. No. No, I'm just used to being on your end. Right. But I kind of like this. It's good, though, right? Yeah. That's good. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about your show. I mean, if somebody doesn't know, of course, uh, her show airs every Wednesday at 9 yeah. p.m. Uh, on Verizon Files Channel 34, Optimum's Channel 68, and every Monday on Verizon Files 34. We'll give you all that time a little bit later on. But <laughs> for those who don't know, a little bit about your show. Uh, basically, it's a well-rounded formatted show. Uh, I do a lot of one-to-one -one interviews with celebrities, artists from the Bronx, community panels, um, organizations, uh, artists that are unsigned. Um, it's a fun show. It's it's bright. It's friendly. It's welcoming, and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what inspired you to put the show together? Uh, well, ever since I was a young child, uh, radio was my best friend, and I always wanted to be around celebrities and be friends with them because uh, it was my best friend. I was the only child, mm. and I went to school for it, and I had a radio show at school, and then I just fell in love with television. I used to watch a lot of videos and um, a lot of personalities doing video shows. And I don't know, I was a very shy, timid female or child, and I just fell in love with being in front of the camera. And you have your own show. So talk to us about it's what it mine. feels like. Right. <laughs> what does it feel like to have your own show, being able to control and do and put things together? It's so amazing. It's my baby. And it actually brought me out of the radio environment mm -hmm. to be more on a broadcast, national television set. Um, it's just more free. You can have discussions. You can get personal with someone. You can let the viewers become friends with them. It's just so much leeway, so much freedom. And I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. You also have something else called the Get In Line Movement. The Get In Line Movement. Gotta yes. get in line, yes. Get in line. Um, it's very sassy, can have a little attitude, but basically it started off something as petty mm -hmm. and it became of movement. <laughs> Uh, the kids love it. Females and males love it. They keep asking me when the line is going to move. And right. I can say it's not going to move. Just mm -hmm. keep getting in line. Um, but actually, it, it's a model of life. Get in line with yourself. Get in line um, with God. Get in line with uh, life. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of, you know, get your get your stuff together. Get your life. Yeah. Get if you want to hate, if you want to love, get in line. Like, right. it just goes to every type of... But take me back, though. You said it started something petty. It's like something petty, you know, I'm a female, mm -hmm. you get a lot of attention, whatever, or people don't like you, just get in the back of the line. It's and then it just started as get in line, and it just stuck with people. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle now. And so now it becomes, a, and now it's a movement. Yeah, now it's a movement. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so when you talk about TV, right, here you are on TV, and as we yeah. said, you know, you've done te television and radio, 
And I tell people that, you know, I do radio as well. Yeah. It's different. You know, it's ra totally radio different. radio has its own life. TV has its own life. What was the biggest transition for you moving from radio to television? To be seen, to talk to the camera, to talk to the viewers, and, and just give as much information as you can. Um, I think that was the biggest, not challenge, but the most exciting thing about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, radio is just a voice and music and entertainment. I feel like with television can go so many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I, I'm very expressive and I like, I guess I like to be seen somehow. And um, yeah, TV was the route for me, it still is. And I know a little bit of your foundation, your background is really about trying to empower. And you we talked about it in yes. the intro about empowering Latinos, yes. minorities. What do you want them to take away from watching your show, from having the experience of seeing these celebrities? What do you want them to take away? Uh, that there's a lot of individuals that are very, very talented, and you don't have to be signed by a major uh, record deal or uh, industry movie film company, but there's a lot of talent here. I want to sh broadcast that. The Bronx is a great place to be, great place to grow up in and, and continue living, um, and to, to be a friend, to mm -hmm. be a friend and someone that they just feel friendly and comfortable with. New year, new season, what can we yes. look forward to? Uh, new artists, new actors coming on. We have a new set. Uh, my production team is amazing. I actually have an event called Fearless Women Organization. We're doing Sipping with a Vision. Basically, it's a networking event at Mount Haven on February 6th from 7 to 10. And um, we're all going to just come together and have a new focus for 2020. All right. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Yes. yes. Romero, host. Thank you. Yes. Good to have you. You too. I've been watching you for years. Oh, thank you. And I finally got, you, you know, selected made, right? to be here, and it was with you. I was very happy. I'm glad. Come back again. Yes, we'll do. Well, if not, I'm, I better get in line, right? That's right. If not, get in line. <laughs> but we'll, we'll put you in the front line. No, we'll, we'll get back. All right. Thank you. Blessings. Blessings. The DSA Show airs every Wednesday, 9 p.m., on our Bronx Day channel on Channel 34, and then also Fios in Channel 68 on Optum. Now, for more information on DSS, of course, you can visit our Facebook page at DSS Romero or on Instagram at Miss DSS One. Now, don't go anywhere, because when we come back, we're going to learn more about how one organization is helping individuals resolve their issues to prevent legal action. That's coming up right after this here on Open. What's up, guys? It's your girl, The Essence, here, right on the set of The De Essence Show. Please tune in each and every Wednesday at 9 p.m., Files 34, Optimum 68, and live streaming, bronxnet.tv. Or you better get in line. There's got to be other gay people in this yeah. borough. That is the goal of this show, to give the community a voice. As writers, as producers uh, that write uh, queer content, you know, we definitely have to open the door for the person behind you. The community always comes through. Things are going to get real here. <laughs> the community really does exist so far beyond just the L, the G, the B, and the T. Whenever um, people are out and proud and, and loud, you know, we get heard. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> And New York City Legal Hand Tremont is helping low-income communities battle civil legal problems by equipping them with the information to resolve their problems. And here now to tell us more about the organization is the director, I should say, of New York City Director of Legal Hand, and it's Ignacio Hauregi Lorga. Excellent. Did well, I do it right? Perfect. I'm starting off the perfect. new year good. Perfect. Good. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year to you. Thank you. So when we talk about legal issues, of yeah. course, a lot of people face them. And you try to make life a little bit easier for people through um, legal services. We do. Uh, so we're a slightly different model from legal services, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to catch people a little bit more upstream from where they already have a, a case. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get to their legal issues before they get to that point. Okay. We're trying to prevent cases from happening, right? We're trying to 
uh, prevent pa cases from, from reaching the court systems, which are already glutted, which, you know, legal services in this city, not enough uh, right. attorneys to go around to help all the people that, that need help, right? So uh, we're trying to empower the communities that we're in. Uh, we're in five places in New York City. We're in two in the Bronx, in High Bridge and in Tremont. Um, community empowerment is, is, is one of our number one goals for the communities that we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're trying to catch people before their cases get down the line. Right. And when we talk about before those cases get, because the Bronx court system, we know, extremely backed up. New York City court, uh, court system, Everywhere. E yep. e extremely backed up. So if I'm a person coming to you or you're coming to me, what do I do in terms of reaching out and what kind of things can you help me with before I reach that courthouse? Well, we'll try to help you with anything, right? If you have any questions, we're going to try to answer them. So all you have to do is walk into one of our sites, mm -hmm. and you don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to talk to anyone first. You just walk into one of our sites. One of our trained community volunteers will sit down with you and talk to you about whatever is going on. We, uh, we've also partnered with two great legal organizations in New York, uh, New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG, and also Legal Services NYC. They provide attorneys that will help the volunteers and help anyone who's really in crisis that comes in. Um, but folks just should just come in, talk about whatever issue they're having, and whatever question they might have, we're going to try to answer it. Are there any predominant issues that we're seeing that you're seeing come across your door mostly? It's New York. We're going to talk about <laughs> housing first, right? right? Um, that is the number one issue that is affecting low-income uh, residents in New York City, always. Housing, and then we have public benefits issues, family law issues. We have a lot of immigration issues, uh, especially in areas like Tremont and, and in Jamaica, Queens, where we're at. Those are the, the predominant issues we're seeing. Yeah, and so when we talk about this, this is a way of giving back to the community, of course. Um, and give us a little bit about that, commu uh, that community commitment, because in order to really do this effectively, you know, it, it really works with community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we want to be good neighbors, right? We want to be trusted neighbors in the communities that we're in. Um, we recruit uh, volunteers from the communities that we're in. We, uh, we train the folks. They are our neighbors. They are the neighbors of the folks that are coming in, right? So we need to, we need to establish that trust with folks. Because a lot of times, people won't deal with s some of those legal issues, especially housing issues uh, or consumer debt issues. They won't deal with them because there's a certain stigma attached to it, mm -hmm. right? Come in, trust us, right? Uh, we are there for for folks, and that's how we're we're going to get folks to come in and try to deal with their issues. We talk about social services, huge here in New York City. A lot of people right. uh, are, are beneficiaries of social services. I know you also do some work in terms of helping people navigate through Absolutely. that. Absolutely. What are some of the things that people are you know really having trouble navigating through? Well, one of the things that uh, folks you know through looking for housing, people mm -hmm. need help looking for housing. They need help getting sometimes their credit in order to look for housing. We've, uh, we partner with a lot of folks. We partner with one organization called Ariva. They have financial counseling. They will come in uh, and help folks clean up their credit, get their credit to a point where they can then apply for housing and have a good chance of maybe getting the housing that, that they need. And so for volunteering at Legal Hand, obviously there's opportunities for people to volunteer. Yeah. Uh, so talk about if a volunteer want, is thinking about that, what's required, what do people need to know? So first thing you should do, uh, go to LegalHand.org. There's, a, there's a, a, a little application there you can, you can fill out to, to become a volunteer. Really, we, t we, we want everybody, right? We have folks who are... Uh, we have folks who are in college who are thinking about law degrees. This is a great little way of... of for them to come in, and we have folks that are uh, retired professionals who have given, you know, an entire career either in social services or, or related fields, and now they're retired, they want to give a little bit more back to the community. So really, it's the commitment to to want to be at Legal Hand, uh, and we ask for a one, uh, one three-hour block per week commitment. Mm -hmm. So many, a lot of folks who do so much more. They right. just, they, you know, they're amazing. Our right. volunteers are amazing, and, and just, the foundation of, of, of our organization. Um, and so just, you know, if you want to volunteer, look us up, legalhand.org. All right, Ignacio, so much. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having us. And we'll be back and continue that conversation again. Absolutely. I dropped my pen. I'll get it back to you. <laughs> All right. Listen, for more information of NYC Legal Hand and their upcoming events, certainly check out their website at legalhand.org or on Twitter at legal underscore hand. Or you can simply give them a call, 929-222-2014. Once again, that number, 929 Two 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 zero one four. 
take it, a quick break, but when we return, we're going to sit down with a financial literacy coach helping you better with your money, so stay tuned. we got more open in this next segment. It's time to get serious about your future. At Bronx Community College, you can earn an Associate of Applied Science degree and become a medical laboratory technician in as little as two years. Earn an average salary of over $50,000 a year in one of the most rewarding careers in medicine. All you need is a high school diploma or equivalent to get started. Those who qualify can get tuition covered by grants and scholarships, so why wait? For program details, contact Bronx Community College today. Thank you for staying with us. Financial literacy is the education and understanding of various financial areas, including topics of managing personal finance, money, and investing. And our next guest is helping people with financial insecurities, and he's held several workshops helping to educate families in hope of revolutionizing the financial service industry. Joining us now to tell us a little bit more about the details about how to better manage your money is financial literacy coach Justin Umpier, and we thank you for much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming and sharing, and it's good to have you. Likewise. Listen, as it's the New Year's around, right, and everybody's talking about New Year's resolutions, getting themselves together, a lot of people make these financial resolutions, and sometimes they go by the wayside real quick. But I'm glad to have you here so we can share a little bit about um, really financial literacy because for a lot of people, um, it's an area where they're really deficient. Yes. Um, it's a huge concern. It's an epidemic that's going around. You know, people, they want to know about their finances. They just don't know where to start, mm -hmm. right? Um, I tell people this all the time. I believe that finance is the most important relationship that we have, you know, in our lives right now. And, you know, people, they would love to retire. You know, they want to have better relationships, but they just don't know where to start. And for myself, it was, I was on a journey myself. I did construction for 10 years. And, you know, it just so happened that I just started to inquire, you know, from the guys that were there, hey, you know, what does your retirement look like? What are your investment uh, portfolios look like? And when I really started to sit down with people who understood money, it was a scary thought for myself. So for my, for my personal journey, you know, it was something that I had to take initiative with. And that's the first thing that I tell people, hey, take, a, take ownership that you want to know more about your personal finance. Mm -hmm. And for myself, you know, just affiliating myself with a financial firm, you know, and, and being able to attend classes where, you know, they teach financial basics. Right? I ask people all the time, hey, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you know about your personal finance? And it's scary the answers that you get. Most people will tell you 5, they'll tell you 3, and I'll simply ask them, hey, are you comfortable going into retirement or making all your financial decisions with that level of understanding? And the first answer that they tell you is no. Right? But that these are things that people just don't plan and they just don't prepare for. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about planning and preparing, 
That's what you do. Yes. You help people get together. Yes. Uh, so walk somebody through. You, you, were, you mentioned one word, portfolio. If somebody's watching right now, doesn't know anything about a financial portfolio, what does that consist of? Um, just the, the diversifying yourself, just understanding the investments that you want to get yourself into. That way, you know, God forbid, if anything was to happen, you know, you're spread thin. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to say spread thin, but you're in a situation where if one doesn't work out for you, you're secured somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about retirement. Everybody wants to be able to retire, go on vacation, take it easy. But that's not the case for a lot of people. And sometimes it's because of poor financial planning. How does somebody get prepared for the area of retirement? Understanding the account that they have, how those things actually work. Uh, for myself, I had a 401k, and I didn't understand how, how the 401k worked, right? And then once I started educating myself, just understanding the penalties, the fees, and the taxes that go into it, the number that I had set for myself going into retirement, right, I thought I would be comfortable with just understanding how those things are going to take place. That number would never be there for myself. Mm -hmm. So going in there with the aspect of saying I want 500000 three quarters of a million dollars, and understanding that penalties, fees, and taxes are going to take out a large chunk of that, you know, I can't retire off of that. And then we start understanding why, you know, a lot of elderly people are continuing to work or they have to go back to work. Right. And when we talk about that, a lot of people are really working beyond the years that they plan on working. Correct. Right? And sometimes people don't have investments. So... How important are investments and what do they do for that financial portfolio? So what the, one of the things that we teach is that, you know, every dollar that you make, you want to treat that like a little military soldier or an employee and, and send that employee out to go work for you. So we teach people the concepts of, you know, how to make money work for yourself. So that's, that's, that's exactly what that is. You know, just being able to understand the accounts that you want to get yourself into and how to protect yourself while you're with these these type of accounts. And asset protection and protection uh, as a whole is something that a lot of people are concerned about. Yes. How to protect their money, given the fact that, you know, we know the stock market is volatile. Right. Uh, and we also know that the state of the economy is also, you know, going back and forth. Correct. Uh, talk about protection. Right. So um, going back into certain accounts where, you know, even going into now with the whole political situation of Trump potentially being vetoed and things like that, these things affect certain um, investment accounts, right? The market now starts to play with the volatility. It goes up and it goes down. And people don't understand. Some people look at it just as a monetary value, but they don't pay attention to how much years they contribute into these things, mm -hmm. right? So now it's not that you're just losing money, but you're wasting years, right? So being able to protect those things, you want to make sure that you at least have a will or trust or an account that can guarantee you, you know, no, a guarantee, no loss. Mm -hmm. And so for financial security, People need to have understanding. Yes. And they have to have training. Yes. And I know you guys do workshops as well. Yes. What is encompassed in the workshop? Who's available to come to these workshops? The workshops are 100% free, right? Everybody and anybody could come to the workshops, right? To have access to the materials is a small fee of $100, right? And that's just so you can have the investment into yourself. Nothing in life is free. So we want people to make the investment into themselves to make sure that, hey, you can, when you graduate this course, you have a better understanding in your finances, mm -hmm. right? And then from that point there, we're going to teach you what's known as a financial foundation. And we treat your financial house the same way you build any house, from the ground up, right? Proper protection, making sure, God forbid, if anything was to prematurely happen to you, your family's taken care of financially. Even though they're going to grieve, you know, emotionally, the finances are something that people don't have to worry about. I witnessed those things firsthand where that portion isn't taken care of and there's fights being broke out, you know, at funeral homes because people don't have their portion. Yeah. Then tapping into debt management, right? Emergency funds. And then lastly, investments. All righty. Well, Justin, thank you so much for sharing with us. I have a question here that's asked, is money controlling you or do you control money? I think we're going to end on that one right there. <laughs> thank you. All right, Justin. <laughs> thanks a lot. Well, listen, let you know the Financial Foundation Educational Workshops are taking place every Tuesday at 7 p.m. until 8.30 and every Saturday from 10 to 12 at the Bronx Financial Center located at 3030 Middletown Road. Once again, that number, oh, I should say the address, 3030 Middletown Road. Now, if you want more information about Justin and his financial literacy workshops, you can email him at j uh, j u m p i e r r e 12 at yahoo.com, and there you can get all the information that you need. Okay, taking a quick break. Be back. Got more. But when we return, we're sitting down with an author discussing his new children's book about Colin Kaepernick. Don't want to miss this. Come right back right after this.
and about the Bronx is what BronxNet is all about. We are BronxNet! Did you know that brain and spinal cord tumors are the deadliest form of pediatric cancer? They can happen to anyone. I'm not hungry. My tummy hurts. You can help us be part of the solution. Get in here. Hurry. You can be part of our family. It's OK. Please support our mission today. Making Headway Foundation, dedicated to the care, comfort, and cure of children with brain and spinal cord tumors. Our next, guest, I should say our next guest is no stranger to the show. When he discussed his first children's book, Sweet Rosa, discussing her civil rights push. Well, now he's released his second book titled Young Cap. Joining us now to tell us a little bit more about the book is author and educator Kingsley Osei and publisher Francois Wilson. And good to have you back. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Welcome us. back. Mm -hmm. New work. Mm -hmm. Yes. As I'm said. so excited about this. Uh, my second baby, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. So yeah, I'm just really excited to get this book out there. And as we look at the title, of course, we talk about Colin Kaepernick mm -hmm. uh, and the activism that he has, mm -hmm. uh, allegedly blackballed. Well, not allegedly. We know he's mm -hmm. been blackballed from mm -hmm. the NFL. Yeah. And you decided you wanted to take this mm -hmm. and bring it out to the public, talking about Young Cap. Yeah. Um, so essentially, I you know I just I'm just wanted to just delve into his activism and um, um, his stance and this whole um, in terms of political and social that he's taking on in terms of um, his role and, and um, pushing his type of, uh, you know, activism out there. So I wanted to touch on that and, 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 and each, like, to talk about this to, for, to kids because I'm also a teacher and um, I wanted to, like, actually put that out for the kids and um, he is this essential political and just prominent figure right now in terms of that and um, I kind of wanted the kids to see it from the point of stance of, um, he's our modern day Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. and um, I think kids just need to know about him in terms of that. And in, in the book, it really delves into not only him, but his um, influences and in, in his inspiration of why he um, took this on the stance, his political stance and his social stance, and also delves into other people as Malcolm X and um, uh, Martin Luther King and people who like influence him as well. Mm -hmm. And Francois, as a publisher, talk to us about your participation in this and why you feel this is so important. All right. I think uh, Kingsley said it already. Mm -hmm. We had the first baby, which is Rosa Park. So what, what better to follow up than, you know, talk about the same social injustice that's going on. Mm -hmm. And when the concept of Colin Ka uh, Kaepernick came up, as far as writing about it, we figured we don't always want to write about people who have necessarily passed. We want to talk about people who are also living and being right. active. So mm -hmm. Colin Kaepernick was the right person to write about because we saw what happens to him when he protested or when he was going against the grain. And we want, we want to revitalize young people saying, it's not, you know, don't wait till you're so old to fight. You know, when are you being oppressed? Talk about it, stand up for yourself. So I think when Kingsley approached me with that idea, I said, let's do it. You know, right. it, mm -hmm. it will definitely invigorate the whole culture, the whole youth uh, movement to actually stand up and fight for themselves. Well, I know you're excited. You have a release event mm -hmm. taking place. Yes, that's going to be on January 18th. It's going to be at Bronx Art Space, 305 East, 140th Street. Um, it's going to happen on um, Saturday, um, 6 to 8 p.m. on that day. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so. so I'm very excited about that. Want everyone to come out, um, support that, and um, as well as the book is coming out January 14th. Mm -hmm. It'll be out on Tuesday, um, and it's a, uh, you know it will be available not only on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, but it'll be um, also available on my website, um, koseofficial.shop. What are you hoping that people take away from the book? So. Um, like he said, just to you know, just to you know, pinpoint in terms of that, like we want um, people in general just to see that this is this is a person that he put. If you think about it, put his whole career on the line, and for this um, this whole whole thing, so just pushing his um, stance about social 
and political stance on this. People are being oppressed to this day, you know what I'm saying, in terms of um, uh, people of my color, and we're being this socially oppressed, and the whole message of being out there, and it just has to be out there in terms of Colin Kaepernick just pushing it. So, like, right now, um, you know, I just want people to take away that, you know, the social injustice is still happening to this day. We are being, you know, in terms of being oppressed to this day. So I want them to actually see that. Um, I want not only just adults, but I want to see kids to see that. Mm -hmm. um, I want my, and I'm very, I very much want my kids to be inspired by what I'm continuously doing and pushing the grain. So, right. yeah. As a publisher, what do you want to see next? Uh, I think this next. Um, I think the universal themes in it, you know, mm -hmm. no matter where it is, whether you're black and brown, across the globe, we all get oppressed. But if we don't talk about it, if we don't write our own history, because um, if Kingsley hadn't put this ideation into mind, we probably wouldn't have put it out. Mm -hmm. So we want young people, whether you're old or black mm -hmm. and brown, write about our story. It, we don't have enough of, a, of, of black and brown stories, you know, fighting. There's always somebody writing for us. So when we write a story, we actually empower ourselves. And we want to see more of ourselves in the school system. And it also inspire the kids who are reading the story to say, hey, you know, I can see myself in the story. So mm -hmm. we want that relationship to, to happen. To have as that far connection. as the reading, the reader, yeah. and the book. All right, well, Kingsley, thank, thank you. Congratulations thank you. again. Thank you good so to have much. you second time around, thank you right? So much. Right. Francois, thank good you to so have much. you. All right. All right, listen, we'll want to let you know the Young Cap book release is taking place on Saturday, January 18th, as Kingsley said, from 6 to 8 at the Bronx Art Space. Now, if you don't know where the Bronx Art Space is, that is located at 305 East 140th Street. And if you want more information on Kingsley and his books, you can visit KOSA Official Shop. Well, we've come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us. Most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch, catch the Recablecast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum's Channel 67. If you have Verizon Files, that would be Channel 33, or watch us anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. And of course, you can catch a brand new episode, episode, I should say, of Open with Rena Valentine on Friday. And that about wraps it up for us here on the set of Open. Darren Jaime saying, make sure to keep this channel wide open. Want to say a special shout out to all those watching on the MNN channel, my sister Ann and the family. Listen, take care. God bless. We'll talk to you soon.